Hello, everyone. This is Jennifer Boxavanis. Can everyone see me and hear me? Okay, I don't see a lot of cameras on, so I am hoping that you all can hear me maybe. Okay, um, Chai Ma, thank you. Ayaz, hello and thank you. It is so great to be here with you all today and you are welcome to put on your cameras. You're also welcome to keep your cameras off. I'm also gonna be asking, um, some Abdullah says no audio. Abdullah, check your computer and see, make sure you don't have it on some sort of sound there because a lot of other people here can already hear me. So I wanted to mention to you all that I am very, very happy to be invited by Astro Labs to give this session today. And I'm going to be sharing my screen very soon to share with you a presentation. I'm gonna be talking to you a lot about something that is very crucial to your businesses, which is selling, client acquisition, sales meetings. It's a me it is the main vein of the majority of our businesses. So Astro Labs very generously invited me and said, Jennifer, let's talk about sales process. Let's talk about sales meetings. Let's talk about how to win commitments. So today we are going to be talking about the five steps to win a commitment during a sales meeting. So during this time, I would like to encourage you all to take notes, take some screenshots, because this presentation is jam packed with some new ideas in mindset process, as well as some sales tools that if you are interested, you are able to actually share them with your team. If you have them, if you have a team or use these sales tools in your next sales meeting. So I'm going to go ahead. I also wanted to let you know that at the end of the, um, I'm going to be going for about 40 minutes. And after that, there is going to be time for question and answers. You are definitely, um, you're invited to ask me any questions that you want during the presentation. I mean, for, about the presentation or about your own specific circumstance um, with, your, with your value proposition or your selling methodology. So please get ready and let's go ahead and dive into the five steps to win a commitment in a sales meeting. The first thing I want to ask you all, and I'm going to ask you all this um, in the chat, is how would you define selling? I'm going to go ahead and write in the chat. I'd like to see your answers on how do you define selling? If you had to give a definition, what would it be? Let's see if we can get some answers in there. Persuading and influencing. Great, Sheila. Relation building. Okay, that's definitely part of it. Persuade someone of the merits of. Problem solving, create the need. Meeting a demand. Great. Exchanging something of value between two parties. Okay, Sarah. Great, these are excellent answers. And I, I use this question in order to kind of get our juices flowing here. Selling is a complex, is a complex um, sort of definition because it's not only a method, but it can be a process. It also can be a habit. It can be a skill. So I'm going to share with you some of the definitions that I've actually put together on selling. So selling can be matching my services with my customer's need. Selling can be solving their problems with my solutions. Selling can be exchanging money for a service or a product, very similar to what Sarah said. Selling can also be helping them making a buying decision. And selling can also be serving your clients. So also one aspect of selling that I would like to add to this definition, which is actually very relevant to the title of this uh, webinar, is influencing someone to take an action right now. 
And that is why the title of this webinar is Five Steps to Win a Commitment. Commitment being that very important word in a sales meeting. So if we take this definition and we look at the different members in Astro Labs and we say, where uh, there are many situations that you are in front, you're confronting that are selling situations. So what are they? You're selling your company to investors. You're selling your services to individuals. You're selling your solutions to other companies being the B2B selling yourself to partners. And in many aspects, you can also be on the receiving end of selling, which is certain, uh, certain candidates selling themselves to you. So what is in all of these different selling situations, a main vein that can underpin everything we're gonna talk about in the, next, um, in the next 30 minutes? My first hint to you is to, if you wanna win more commitments, is to make sure that your selling method or your selling process moves from being product centric to customer centric. So what exactly does that look like? And everything we're gonna be talking about in these next few minutes is going to be about being more customer centric. Just to give you an overview, when an organization is very product centric, they have marketing that creates targets and ads and pushes product information in the selling, they selling, they solicit closing deals, upselling and cross-selling. And then they wait until the customer is a little bit dissatisfied and then receives and resolves inquiries. A more streamlined process that would be, and of course, this is a very broad stroke way of looking at it. Customer centric would be identifying a customer's need and problem, selling that type of solution to them, receiving money, having them pay the bills, and then request having them request help to resolve any further problems. That makes for a more happy customer. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, I just wanted to take a moment, as a lot of you don't know me, is who is this lady and why is she sharing this information with us? My name is Jennifer Boxamanis, and I am a sales enablement coach, and I have been one for here in Dubai for over 10 years. I help um, organizations, um, I help sales teams, I help them increase their conversion rates, shorten their sales cycles, handle objections like the price objection, and talk to their customers in a more convincing way. How do I do that? Well, before COVID-19, I was working in, in, in organizations, companies helping them build sales processes and training their sales teams on those sales processes. Um, also identifying some missing sales tools and um, bringing them together to help them increase their probability of closing rates. I do that through sales coaching and sales process development. I use live when available, as well as video coaching sessions. And I also host public webinars that I'll be talking about um, a little bit later. So before I was a sales coach, of course, I was a sales manager. And before that, I was a sales executive. I have a very talented, um, I have a very nice track record. And in one of my jobs, I was selling very high ticket items to very difficult to reach people, as you can see in this slide here. Okay, so let's go back to the selling. Enough about Jennifer, because this is really not about me, it's about you. So how can you increase your top line? How can you increase your market share? Well, there's two different ways you can do that. You can look at selling as in what are the behaviors, the beliefs, or the skills that you're portraying in front of your potential customer, or you can look at what are the steps that you can follow to win over more customers faster. The way I organize um, my trainings and the way I've organized this presentation for you today is definitely very much more process-based. So please get ready, put on your seatbelt, and let's talk about process. So what is a sales process? A sales process is the activities and the steps the sales team uses to approach potential clients and convert them into paying clients. So wouldn't it be interesting to be able to map that out in easy to follow steps? When I'm working with many different sales teams, usually the CEO, the managing director, and sometimes the founder is always telling me the same thing. Jennifer, can you get that my sales team sells exactly like I do? And I said, absolutely. It's all about looking at how you're doing it, how you do it, and divide it up into different steps. So my recommendation to you all 
who are working as one or two persons teams or those of you who have bigger sales teams is to create and document a sales process with sales tools for your team for measurement purposes, a reference point, as well as a performance tool. How can you do that? Well, today we're going to go over five different steps that you can use in a sales meeting. And I'm going to offer you a sales process that if you want, you can adopt yourself and start to use it tomorrow. The most important thing is the simplicity about it. So let's go ahead and dive in. I first want to tell you a story about a, a gentleman named Sam. And I think this will be quite relevant for you all. I am actually hosting a series of webinars right now. And when, I, when I'm hosting these webinars, I'm sending out a lot of emails to my client base as well as on LinkedIn, and I'm promoting these webinars. As people are starting to sign up, they come into LinkedIn, they come into my mailing base, they buy tickets, they get sent Zoom links, and then they join the webinars. Sam was one of the gentlemen that did that. He happens to be owning a tech company that works a lot with email automation. So after he attended, uh, he went through the process of joining my webinar, paying and joining. He then, after the webinar said, Jennifer, it seems like you have a lot of steps that you have to go through in order to get people to be a part of your webinar. Have you ever, how much time is that taking you? Is it, is it something that's efficient for you? And I said, well, no, it's really not that efficient. He said, as I was going through that process, I realized that there was like three different, um, different programs that you were using in software. And I said, that's correct. And he said, would you like to have a meeting and I can talk to you about making all of that into one um, piece of software? And I said, absolutely. And you can imagine as a sales coach, I get very excited when someone's going to sell to me because I'm always on the selling side or teaching people how to selling side. So I want to tell you exactly what Sam did during that sales meeting. We, of course, this was during lockdown time. So we got on a video sales meeting and he's, he was very nice with me, introduced himself again to me and, and reminded me of what, what the meeting was all about. And then he had another person that was his technical guy. And he turned to me and he said, Jennifer, should we um, talk a little bit more about you or should we just dive into the technical demo? And I said to him, you know what, Sam, this is your meeting. Why don't you run it the way you want to? Sam said, okay, and he dove into the technical part of um, his software with his technical guy. And as they were going over the different, the demo, I was starting to get excited about some things and less excited about others. And I was like, oh, that looks really interesting. Oh, that's really cool. And I was starting to make calculations in my head. I like that. I don't like that. I like that. I don't like that. And at the very end of the meeting, Sam turned to me and he said, so Jennifer, what do you think? And I said, something very general because it had been a lot of information for me. And I said, it looks good. Um, but my question to you is Sam, how much is it going to cost? And he said to me, well, Jennifer, what's your budget? And I know I was a little bit mean here. I decided I'm going to say something that a lot of buyers say, I don't really have a budget for this. I want to see what the price point is. And Sam said, I'm excited. I'll go send you a proposal. So he went away. What, and just to make this proposal for me. And meanwhile, I decided to do my own calculations. How much is it costing me with the software I'm using, not only in price, but as well as work? And I came up with a figure. Let's just say for the sake of this, this example that I'm spending about $1,000 in what I'm doing. And so I thought that's gonna be my baseline point. Sam came back, he sent me a five page proposal. I literally flipped through the proposal to get to the very last page and saw that the price point was going to be $3,000 a month. In my head, I said, you know what? I'm already doing something with 1,000. It might be good, it might be bad, but he's offering 3,000. You know what? I'm just gonna with my 1,000. And I told him that. So my question to you is, and I'd like to ask you this in the chat box. What do you think that Sam, what do you think that Sam did not do correctly? What did Sam do wrong in that whole process? So if everyone can mute themselves, it'll be really helpful for us. Okay, Kalpesh, um, didn't, uh, Sheila, didn't ask you 
didn't ask you your pain points. Kalpesh didn't understand what you wanted. Sheila didn't ask you about your pain points. Okay, very good. Anything else? Get to know more. Awesome, right, exactly. Comfort zone. So Sam was sort of in his comfort comfort zone. Rami didn't qualify you enough. Yeah. And and to be in with Rami's comment, I would like to say that I actually was a qualified buyer, but he needed to, and I think this is what Rami means, further discover about me. Um, Abdullah, he shall give you a demo period. I didn't really want a demo period. Why would I waste my time if I know it's going to cost me 3000 Sheila, see what you actually needed and included it with scaling, with scaling your business in mind. Absolutely. So these are really good answers. So let me just give you a, a, um, a scenario, a, my summary of what I think Sam did wrong. First of all, he made some assumptions about my needs. He didn't really, uh, kind of what Rami said, he didn't qualify me enough. He didn't really ask me the questions. He didn't verify those assumptions. He could have come on with his technical guy and been like, Jennifer, I think you're using three, you know, you, I think you're using three different softwares for this. Is that correct? Yes. So how much time does that take you? How are they, how are they connecting those softwares? Is it easy to use all three of those together? Secondly, he immediately focused on his product. He actually asked me the question, should we have a little chit chat about you or should I go into my demo? I said, do what you want. And he jumped into his product. He also did not take the time to discover my challenges or objectives. What is it that I want to do? Sort of along that comment about scaling my business. He didn't discover my budget. Um, he asked me what it was, but I didn't tell him. He could have used another technique, which I teach sales teams all the time of trying to find out budgets. And he didn't really close on me. He sent, said, can I send you a proposal? So how many times have you been in a situation to where you think that you've closed because the prospect has told you, send me a proposal? Well, guess what? You're going to go back and spend four hours on a proposal just for them to do exactly what I did. Flip, flip, flip in 30 seconds, see the price and tell you no. So today we're going to be talking about the five steps, that you, five steps you can use to win a commitment in a sales meeting. These five steps can be in one sales meeting themselves, or it can be these steps can be used many in many sales meetings as you have multiple sales touch points and multiple sales interactions with your potential customers or your actual customers as you are selling to them. I would also like just to make a small point here that this is going to be more for B2B and B2B sales that are face-to-face -face or in this point of time, more video to video. So I have created a very easy to follow sales process that is based on solution-based selling and consultative sales. That's called the S-A-L-E-S -E process. There you can see the five steps is the first step is study. And we're gonna be talking about each one of these steps in, um, in, in, in a summarized way. The next step is going to be alliance, building an alliance, building a friendship or navigating through different companies to get to decision makers. The next step is L, the discovery, that kind of further qualification that, that Rami had written in the chat box is learning about the customer's buying criteria, which is what Sam failed to do. Educate and explain. That's sort of the presentation part of the sales meeting is when you're going to educate on the different options and explain how your solution can help. And then probably one of the most important parts that's going to tie everything together, which is a secure a commitment at the end of every single sales interaction that you have. So we're going to be going over these very, very um, briefly. So let's first talk about step S. Before you even think about making a sales meeting, sending out a, a, a warm email, you know, linking up with someone on LinkedIn, it's really important to research who your ideal customer is. Now, in the B2B sales world, we're not talking about that one specific person. We're talking about organizations and sometimes sectors that can actually profit from our value propositions. Then the next step is to map out their profiles. And mapping out your profile is what you can do is called an ideal customer profile. I have five things. Can everybody make sure that they mute? I need the three voice eggs on. Nothing is. Yes. Abdullah, can you mute, please? 
Uh, okay, we'll work with Abdullah. Um, meanwhile, what you want to do is you want to put together a very simple ideal customer profile. There are ones out there that are very intricate, but this is the ones that I use with my client. Who is your ideal customer profile segment? Maybe it's the financial services. Maybe it's a cer certain group of people that are in manufacturing and map out ahead of time with your team, brainstorm, what are their needs? What are their top challenges when it's coming to something related to your value proposition? What is their desired vision? What, how can your deliverables align with that? And what is your company's competitive advantage when looking across at their desired vision, their top challenges compared to the other people that are in the market offering what you offer? After you create that ideal customer profile, plan your outreach, whether that be a phone call, a LinkedIn connection, an email, and then plan your sales meeting based on their profile. So we're going to be talking about that. How can you plan your sales meeting? Well, one way to do that is to understand you don't want to be product centric, similar to what Sam did. Sam decided he was going to learn his service, his technical service. He was going to contact me. He was going to present his product and service. He was going to wait for my questions, which I didn't have any. And then he's going to push me for a sale with the proposal. As you see, that did not work. And what we talked about a few slides ago is becoming more customer centric. What does the more customer centric process look like? Is that S-A-L-E-S? Is studying my customer ahead of time, creating a connection with them, learning their needs, challenges, and goals, whether that be first in the ideal customer profile, making those assumptions ahead of time, and then during the sales meeting to actually ask questions to verify those needs. Educate and explain, become the advisor that says, look, I've understood what you've said, and then secure a commitment for the next step. When I work with sales teams, we work a lot on that middle block, which is the L, learning the customer's needs, challenges, and goals. And we're going to have a few slides on that now. But before you can start asking some really deep questions about challenges and pain points, it's important to create an environment that is safe and actually comfortable for your potential customer. How can you do that? Well, first of all, research who you're going to go speak to and make sure that you use that research in order to build a connection with them. That's kind of the break the ice when you get into sales meetings. Then make sure you initiate a relationship that can lead to a deep to some deep sales conversations. And that's just not coming in and pushing your product. It's just getting a little bit more friendly with whoever you're speaking to in whatever context that is. So going back to the S-A-L-E-S -E process, we've had a slide on study on how to research ahead of time and plan your sales meeting ahead of time. A for alliance, making sure that your first step in any sales interaction, whether it be video or face-to-face, -face, is to create that friendly atmosphere. Well, the next step is going to be L, learn about customers buying criteria. So if you need to learn about that, how can you learn? Well, the best way to learn is probably ask questions. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, Jennifer, well, what questions should I be asking during a prospect sales meeting? I mean, I already ask a lot of questions about what they need and what the requirements are, but a lot of times, and I think this is quite relevant for tech, technology companies in its own are not really a sector. Technology is a tool in order to help people live easier lives. So what is it about your technology that's enabling others to solve some of their problems or get some towards their desired outcomes? You know, everything from Zomato to Washman is all just to help us with ease of life. So when someone comes up to me and says, what is your requirement for your laundry or what is your requirement for your delivery service? And of course, I'm being very simplistic here. I'm going to say, I don't have one. I'm already doing something. So what if we were to maybe, what if I'm inviting you to actually look at questions as though an iceberg that buying criteria requ requirements and needs are, of course, a very important part of asking questions. But I would like to invite you to start to add questions about their challenges and pains add questions about what their visions are, what the reality is that they are facing right now. What is the impact if they don't change from what they're doing? And what is the timeline of making any changes? In the B2B world, 
of sales, especially in the B2B world, we always have us coming in and knocking on doors or people coming to us and asking us to please come and see them. All of these questions are quite relevant. So my, my, my suggestion to you is to build what I call a question bank. And that question bank can be a list of questions that can be for each type of customer segment that you are approaching. And in those, that list of questions, every time you can go to a sales meeting, you can go to that bank and actually choose the questions that are most relevant for that type of customer. Obviously, you're not going to be asking pages and pages and pages of questions, but my invitation to you is to create a question bank that has lots of different questions that you can choose for you can choose from for any sales situation. So what are some examples as I want you all to take a screenshot of this. These are a little bit of a generic questions that you can tailor, but they kind of hit across all those different categories. So one very good question you can ask when you are seeing a potential customer is say, look, we're here, we're here together. What is the vision that you have for your company right now or for, for, for your organization? How are you getting there right now? What challenges are you facing? And obviously you are looking for the answers to be in context to the outcomes that your company is offering, not just a vision that has nothing to do with, with your service offering. How is that impacting your business? What are your requirements and needs currently? As I said, requirements and needs are really important to know, but it's only part of the sales puzzle when it comes to qualifying and discovery. How are you solving this now? What other options are you looking at? Who else are you talking to? This comes up a lot. I didn't know they were looking for other quotes. Well, ask them. What is your timeline? What is your budget range? Who else will be making a decision with you? And this is a very powerful question that I ask at almost any sales meeting I have. What are the three most important criteria for our proposal to you? So you can really get to know what is important to them. So after you ask these questions, you have finished the L part of your sales process, where hopefully you will understand what are their biggest drivers. They have pain points to solve, they have challenges to solve, or no, they are interested in finding a technology to help them get to a bigger and better space in efficiency. They have a vision to fulfill. Well, what happens next is the educate and explain your solution. When you start to understand what exactly is driving your potential buyer to potentially use your services and you can link that with your presentation, whether it be a demo, a proof of concept, talking points or a slide presentation, that is where you create true value. And that's exactly where Sam went wrong. Sam, when he was going through his presentation or his demo, he couldn't say to me, Jennifer, because you mentioned X, let us show you how this works in our demo. Because you're struggling with why, let me show you how this works in our demo. Because you explained you want help in this, let me show you how our program, our software can help you do that. You see, he didn't create the value. So at the end of the day, I judged him on price. So I want you to look into your own sales process and say, Am I selling on value? Am I, and, and the way to ask that is, am I truly discovering what my potential customer needs and linking that, my presentation to those needs in those sales interactions? And if the answer is no, well, this is the right presentation for you. So whether you are giving a presentation when it comes to the E part of the sales process, or you have a slide deck, or you just have talking notes, or you have a proof of concept or a demo, and this can be at different stages in your sales cycle, I want you to make sure that you relate it to your prospects, vision, challenges, pain points, and needs. Where do I find that out? Well, you just heard it if you asked all those questions. This is a really good slide to take a, a, a slide shot of. Make sure in those that presentation, share your methodology, share relevant deliverables and outcomes, share similar client stories, share those before and afters with your client stories. Speak about what they were what they were going through before and what they went what they were experiencing after they started to use your technology, and make sure you also share what are the next steps in working together. So after that, what happens is. We get, to the, we get to the secure part 
of the sales process. And my recommendation is that every single sales interaction that you have, whether that be three meetings or 30 meetings, that it always ends with securing a commitment. That commitment can be one of the smallest commitments or it can be actually signing the deals. You know the, the steps that they need to take in order to close with you. So what I'm finding with the salespeople I'm working is that there's two mistakes that are continuously happening in this part of the sales process. Well, number one, in 50% of meetings, salespeople don't make a com commitment attempt at all, which basically makes a sales meeting a waste of time. And then there's other salespeople that are uncomfortable with the close, with the securing of the commitment, and are most likely not saying the, same, the right thing. What happens in that situation? Time and time again, I have sales managers, sales directors telling me, Jennifer, we're, we're spending four hours on proposals and we are getting ghosted, which means we can't even get an answer if they've even read it or not. Well, that's, be that's because one thing is happening is that you're not asking for a joint commitment. <gasps> Jennifer, how can I go into a sales meeting and ask the potential customer to make a commitment with me? Of course you can. Each party takes one many steps towards working together. When I work with sales teams, we map out what are those many commitments that you can ask your your potential customer to take with you at the same time? Is that sending you over some specific information? Is that making a, an appointment to review the proposal together the next week? Every single commitment can be a joint commitment, which shows that you all are potentially are going to work together. So what happens after you ask for that commitment? Two things happen. Well, Number one, you get a yes, let's move forward with that commitment, whether that be preparing a proposal and meeting up again to talk about it or speaking to the decision maker or signing the contract or something that is exactly not a yes. And it's sort of a silence or a hesitation, which we call sales um, objections. So what do you what is another way to deal with objections? So as we are talking about all these different sales tools, my invitation to you is to actually prepare your objection handling ahead of time. Take your different ideal customers and say, what are the typical objections I'm receiving? I'm receiving, it's too expensive. How can I handle that objection on the spot? I'm receiving, I'm not the decision maker or not now, maybe later. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could actually map out how you're going to handle those objections ahead of time and train your team on it. After you handle objections, my hint to you is make sure you bring your potential customer back to the commitment so you can move forward in the sales process. So I know I've gone through this sales process pretty quickly, but I want to show you some of the takeaways and some of the ways that you can move forward with your own sales process or doing this for your own sales team. So for a successful B2B client acquisition through sales meetings, I would suggest that you follow these steps and build these tools in order to have a reference point for everyone in the organization and increase your probability for more business. First of all, build your sales tool, the ideal customer profile. We spoke about that one. Build your sales process aligned with your value proposition and your target customers. I gave you the S-A-L-E-S. -E You're welcome to use that and maybe make some modifications to it. Number three, build your sales tool, the question banks for sales meetings. They are so powerful to already have those questions thought out and ready to go ahead of time. Number four, build your sales tool, aligning your presentation with your customer creating value right there. Number five, plan how you will secure a joint commitment for the next step. And number six, build the common objection handling sheet. Map out your common objections and figure out how you're gonna handle them ahead of time. I've done this with many organizations. So I also wanted to, um, I wanted to offer to you all, if you need some help with that, I work with organizations and we have a six week program where we actually create these tools together with your sales team and yourselves in a workshop format. 
The first week is sales messaging during sensitive times where we actually build the ideal customer profiles with your team, talking about what different customers that you, were going, that you are approaching. The next week we talk about how to make sure that you're making your presentation, that it's offering solutions and not just services or products. In the third week, we start to build that question bank together. The workshop is questions to eliminate the price objection. In the fourth week, we actually go and build the sales process from the different tools that we've been putting together. Maybe it's the SALES with three other steps. Maybe it's something more simple, something to where everyone in the organization is following the same steps in every sales interaction, whether that be through email or video sales calls. In the fifth week, we talk about closing. What is the closing formula? What is the way that you can close and ask for a joint commitment in every sales interaction? And on the sixth week, we have that double header of objection handling, where me and your team get together and we put together all the objections that you're receiving and how to handle them throughout the sales process. If this is something that will interest you, I will be sending you an email about this and you're welcome to have a conversation with me to talk about if, uh, if it would be a good match to work with your team. Now, this is um, one of my one of my participants, Catherine Budd. She's co-founder at Nine Money. Nine Money. And um, she actually has a comment about one of the webinars that she's gone through with me. Um, wanted to say, uh, this has been, I've just made like two more pages of notes, has been so useful. But I also just wanted to let you know that um, since the previous webinar, like the thing that I really took home about the, um, from that webinar was translating from, from what your client is saying into this means this for you. And so I just wanted to let you know that I have been talking to like quite a massive organization in Saudi for a long time about uh, something which we will be announcing soon. And um, I used that tip basically because I knew that our main contact there was taking our proposal of what we wanted to do to all of his main stakeholders, like in this enormous organization for a meeting. So I knew that I wasn't going to be there, but he was basically our advocate on our behalf, selling it in internally. So I sent him an email the night before saying, this is your sound bites to say for the meeting. And I just wrote like four or five the X, Y, Z, this means this for your organization. This means this for your organization. And this means this for this person in your organization. And we basically got a positive result from them last night. So literally just from that one tip, like I've only done this webinar, like one webinar with you, you know, it really, that's something we've been working on for like six months. So it just really helped to get it over the line. So, but I mean, I can't believe just from that one tip, how impactful that was. So like just having this system today, like what you're saying, it just resonates so much. I'm like, how have we never thought of these things before? <laughs> like, it seems so obvious when you're going through it to make this system for like each industry and just to make this toolkit, like Brian was saying, but I just feel like we're just getting access to this incredible resource that you have. And like, you know, I've worked in sales environments before, but like this just is having so much impact on me personally. So just wanted to share that with you. Okay. Well, you're getting over to us in one hour. I just, it's amazing. So let's say that maybe you don't have a large sales team and coming in and doing these workshops with you and your team to build all of these tools is not the right step for you right now. Maybe you're just a one or two man team. I do have public webinars where we don't build the tools exactly for your team, but we do do, we have presentations and webinars on how to build the tool yourself. I am actually starting the third series of those webinars on August the 17th. I'll be finishing the second series actually tomorrow. So if you're interested, I'm actually having an early bird sale on attending those. Once again, it's not workshopping it with your team. It's just coming and watching how to do it yourself for 505 dirhams. It's 10 hours of sales training that'll be starting August the 17th. And it's just one and a half hour a week with me every Monday. So you can do it from anywhere you're at, even if you're on vacation. I will be sending you an email about that later on. And you're also feel free to contact me. Um, I work with Freshstone Consulting. Um, I also uh, have a, a blog, which is jenniferboxavanas.com, where I give interviews as well as 
uh, lots of sales process tips and articles. Um, I can go ahead and subscribe all of you to that blog and you're, you're welcome to use all of that information to help you. I'm also on LinkedIn. Please look me up at Jennifer Box of Honest and on Instagram at Boxy Sales Coach. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop the share and you are welcome to come out and ask me any questions about this presentation or about any sort of sales um, issues that you're finding in client acquisition. So I will be here until five o'clock. So you're welcome to stay here and just listen to the questions that are happening. Um, or you can just kind of, um, um, you, can, you can just ask a question. So I think I have one here um, that is um, from Calpech, how to effectively use step E when faced with not so collaborative prospects. So Calpesh, step E is the educate and explain step. And that would normally come after the L step, which L is learn when you're asking questions. So I, I would, and you, you're welcome to come out here if you're still online. I see you are online. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that your question is they're not ask, answering your questions, not so much they're not listening to your presentation. Is that correct? Yeah, that is right. So basically sometimes you're trying to elicit response and trying to understand them better, but uh, you can be stonewalled because perhaps those questions are not right or they don't want to divulge information because they want to know how smart you are in finding out about what they want. So that mm -hmm. also happens yeah. sometimes. And, and, I, and I totally agree with you. And, and I've actually, um, when I work with sales teams on many occasions, um, I actually go to sales meetings with them and um, I run a sales audit to see what their team actually needs. So I'll go to sales meetings, which now is more done virtually. Um, so I've seen that happen. And it's just because of maybe a personality or an industry. So I have a couple of different advice for that. Um, number one, our favorite subject in the entire world is not actually, I mean, do you know what their favorite subject is in the entire world? Each person has a favorite subject. Do you know what it is? Uh, no, sorry. It's not the weather, it's not God. Yeah. It's actually ourselves. Okay. We love to talk about ourselves. And that is one of our favorite things to do. And I know almost all of us have a friend out there that we're like, oh, I don't want to talk to that friend. I don't want to hang out with that friend because all he or she ever does is talk about him or herself. And it just gets boring. And then a lot of us, not all of us, we have friends out there that were like, I love hanging out with that person because they're always asking about us. And we're talking about our favorite subject, me, myself, and I. So using that premise, what I would like to say is the majority of people and of course it changes a little bit in the professional atmosphere is want to speak about themselves. And of course, in a professional atmosphere, we're not talking about themselves. We're talking about our organizations, our positions, our sectors, our kinds of things. So it's all about positioning your questions in a way that they're like, Oh, there's a salesperson here that actually wants to talk about my favorite subject, which is me, myself, and I, okay. I would like to divulge in that. Because what normally happens is, is that the salespeople will come in and they'll talk about the product first, like, like Sam did, and then ask the questions. So then by that time, just like I did with Sam, is I start to make the calculations in my head and I don't want him to be a part of that conversation. But if he starts at the beginning asking me questions, then I can, of course, tweak my presentation to talk about what I learned from that conversation. So my first piece of advice is, is to understand that everyone likes to talk about themselves. My second piece of advice is when you enter a meeting, a really nice bridge could be, and it could be that the prospect says to you, Kalpesh, please, you know, get to the point. Tell me, tell me what your presentation is all about. And you can say, Mr. I will definitely show you all about my, 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 my value proposition after. But first of all, I just want to understand a little bit about, you know, what you're looking for or why we're even having this meeting or just want to get to know a little bit more about 
what's going on with your organization, keeping it real light. So I can make sure that even if it's necessary, we even have the presentation because maybe it's not even necessary. Of course, you're going to have the presentation, but you just say that because it relaxes the person. And then you just dive into the first question and say, okay, so what are you guys doing in reference to boom, boom, boom? And, and that boom, boom, boom is your, what the kind of technology or the kind of value proposition that you have. Secondly, so number one is people like talk about themselves. Number two, come in, you know, humbly and say, yeah, we're going to talk about the presentation, but let me find out more about you. They kind of relax. And then thirdly, make sure that you plan your questions ahead of time and make sure that they start from very general to very specific. Don't come in, what's your challenge? People freak out. Like, okay, hey, so what are you guys doing in reference to this? What's going on with that? Who are you talking to? And then start to get closer and closer and closer to what you want to talk about. Does that help? Yeah, I think definitely it helps. Uh, some useful advice there. Yeah, give it a try and you let me know sure. how it goes. Sure, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kalpesh. We have one from Sheila. No problem, Ayaz. How do you make an effective first sales meeting within a 20 minute time frame, especially when the person appointed to attend the organization is just going through the paces? So um, is, is and, and Sheila, is this that, um, is the 20 minute time frame one that they, that you are imposing on them or they are telling you it's only 20 minutes? They're telling you it's only 20 minutes. Okay, this is great. I wrote an article about this, I think last year. So that's great. Um, and so I wanna go back to that same premise of our favorite subject is me, myself and I. So if you come in there, they are gonna have their you know, stopwatch ready. And as you said, they're just going through the paces. So first of all, identify the person in the organization, maybe identify where they are in the decision-making if you can ahead of time and say, okay, that person is an influencer, that person is a decision-maker. So I'm gonna make sure that the commitment I'm asking for is aligned with that. If you're with an influencer, the commitment you're gonna be asking for at the end is, hey, can we talk to the the person I need to talk to. If it's a decision maker, it'll be somebody, something along the line of where you need to go with your next step in the sales process and their buying process. So when there's a 20 minute um, time frame, I would make similar suggestion that I did with Calpesh. You come in, you've researched what you're, which, what, what they're all about. You've written down some questions. You feel prepared. So you say, hey, you make you you break the ice with some nice alliance. You know, I understand we only have 20 minutes, so I just want to take a few minutes ahead of time and talk to you a little bit about what's going on with your organization regarding X, which has to do with your value proposition or your or the design or the outcomes that you actually are going to be talking about. And then, um, yeah, and then, you know, if and of course, we're going to go through the presentation if we have time. So the thing is, is that they want you to talk about your presentation, but that's not what you want because you can't build value if you don't know what they're looking for. So I believe in these situations, in my experience, I have seen 20 minutes all of a sudden becomes 40 minutes. And also that person's like, wow, I get to talk about my favorite subject. So I would dive into the questions and say, and then as the 20 minute mark comes, be super astute and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs., our 20 minutes are over. Should we continue? Should I come back with the information that you've already given me and then make the presentation and let them decide? Because honestly, if they've sat there the entire time and talked about themselves, they are happy. They're happy to continue. They're happy to let you back in and talk about what your presentation is. And it's actually a bonus for you because you actually will have time to tailor that presentation according to what you learned. How does that sound to you, Sheila? Great, give it a try. Let me know how it goes. Are there any other questions? Um, hi, Jennifer. Hi, Asan, how are you? Hi, how are you? Great. Love What's you. on okay, I have a quick one, right? So basically, I'm into IT, right? And for SME, sectors right i just want to know for a small medium-sized company how would you break the ice so you have the right product you have the right services but how do you get someone or how do you convince someone with your ability to complete that project or present yourself 
as an icebreaker? Well, okay, I think we're mixing two things here. So I, I have two different answers for you. Um, I think breaking the ice should be at the beginning of, especially the first time that you meet, whether that be you know face to face or video to video. And I think that a really good way to break the ice is to look up the organization or the people that you're talking to and look on their LinkedIn profile, see if there's any similarities of things that you can talk about that is not business related. Now that's not always easy because people don't put a lot of personal things um, on their on their LinkedIn, but it could be that you see that they studied in in Edinburgh and you're like, oh, I've actually been there. I saw you studied there. Just something very simple to break the ice that once again, they see that you're interested in them, not personally, but as a person. So I think that that's one way. Another thing is, is that sometimes that information is not available to you. So just breaking the ice with something that's going on right now in the world that's not so grim like COVID-19, but just like, oh, hey, talking about summer holidays or something like that. Um, so um, that would be one way to break the ice. Now, the second thing is that you mentioned is having to show that you can actually complete the project. Now, one of the best ways to ever do this without having to say, I can do this, I can do this, is to have similar client success stories. That can be in form of a testimonial. That can be in form of a story you tell. I, when the sales teams I work with, I will not let them leave the office to go talk to a potential customer until they have planned out the story that they are going to talk about and what happened as the before and after, right? So you're going to be like, you know what, after you, after you've broken the ice, you've discovered their, their objectives, their pain points, their challenges, and then you presented your solution with that presentation in whatever format it is, you say, you know what, we worked with a company just like yours that had exactly the same problems that you have, that had exactly the same objectives that you had. And because you know what they are, because you've been asking them about them, then you say, let me tell you a story. They had this, this, and that. We worked with them and their, their outcomes were this, this, and that. So that is the most brilliant way. And even putting a slide in your deck about that. I have two slides in my sales presentation about um, customers. What do you think about that? Good, good. Okay, thumbs up, you give it a try. We have three more minutes, so we have a chance for one more question. Well, I will be in um, communication. Astro Labs will be passing me your emails. I'll be in communication with you in email. So you're very welcome to reach out to me and we can also set up, you know, um, small meetings to talk about these um, issues more in detail. Thank you, Sheila. I hope to see you too. Thank you, Katerina, thanks. Thanks, Ahsan, thank you. Thank you, Tarun. Yes, everybody be safe, exactly. Keep on making your, let's keep on staying on videos. It's the best. Thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful rest of Tuesday, and I'll see you guys online. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kalpesh. Thank you, Pradeep.